just don't want to make anyone nervous, scared, or create doubt in their minds when speaking with them. So please be cautious of what you share with them and try not to create panic right. um, or share anything political or personal views of the matter. We stick to the facts as pharmacists. So. Hello and welcome to Rising into Mindful Motherhood. Today's interview is a unique one as I will be talking with my husband, Joel, who is also a pharmacist and health coach on a rather personal topic. We will be sharing our story on when we were both fired from our pharmacy retail employer for questioning the safety and expressing our moral, ethical, and religious concerns of administering the COVID-19 shots under EUA in children and minors in May of 2021. Welcome, Joel, and thanks for being here today to have this open conversation with me. Hi, glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. I've been waiting to get on the podcast. <laughs> Would you like to speak to the comment made from our regional pharmacy manager heard in the very beginning of the podcast? Sure. Um, I, I think one thing that is very important and paramount to, I think, medicine in general is informed consent and sharing with people the potential side effects and reactions and and consequences that medication therapies can have. Um, it, it's not, you know, it's never done to create doubt or to scare people. Um, it's to tell people the, to, to tell people and prepare people for the reality of what could happen. The same thing is true for people who are going to have a surgery. The surgeon tells them, you know, what, what, what could go wrong and what could, could not go wrong if something were to happen. It's not meant to create doubt or fear. It's to be honest so that people are prepared and informed as to what can happen. Exactly. Um, the side effect list is not always going to be pretty or something that one wants to experience, but nevertheless, still very important to share with our patients. So can you comment on the sticking to the facts as pharmacists in regards to the pandemic and the COVID shots? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think it's still, it, honestly, when it comes to the facts, in my opinion, it depends on who you ask. Um, because some people will tell you that it was created in a wet market. And just recently, we found out that it the Department of Energy believes it did come from the Wuhan uh, Virology Lab. So there are so many facts that have been either censored, um, on social media through, you know, physicians, doctors, PhDs, other informed people expressing their professional opinions, which, you know, for people like us as pharmacists could be facts. I mean, we have to use our own judgment, but you need to be able to interpret what people say, you know, papers coming out, um, you know, may say they have facts. Uh, and then uh, like the Lancet retracts their HCQ paper, you know, what, six months or however long after, so the facts were ever always either ever always changing as it came down to COVID or they were censored or uh, Pfizer didn't want to release the data for 75 years. So, you know, we weren't even supposed to know any facts until like 2092 or something like that. So I don't think it's fair to say we stick to the facts. I mean, when we made our decision, uh, we were looking at we were looking at facts. We we were not just having a political bias or a, a, a personal uh, vendetta against COVID or our company or anybody. We were trying to stick to the facts the best that we could find them, research them as as they were coming out. Absolutely, and things were coming out daily, weekly. You know, it was a learning curve and process for everyone you know it's still very much an experimental shot and we're still learning every day even still now nearly two years later more and more things are coming out so when did we start administering the COVID-19 shots within our company when we were still working for them uh so our company started administering them um in December uh, to certain populations that they had access to, the elderly population. We, uh, 2020, yeah, 
uh, we started to, uh, Katie and I started to administer the shots in uh, early January in the retail setting of 2021. And which shots were we administering and what was the age range in terms of how these shots were being rolled out? Yeah, great question. So in uh, our company was initially using Moderna. Uh, that was the shot that we had, which at the time was currently approved for people 18 and older. Uh, but I'm not sure if it was state or federal who had made the determinations. I, th I believe it was the state, but it started off, I think, 70 plus or 65 plus. Um, and then as time went on, they slowly started to as time went on, they slowly started to incorporate more age groups. I think most of that was based off of having stock of vaccine, um, making sure that it was getting to enough people enough people in the elderly population at the time. And then as we were able to have more supply, uh, they started to open up who we could give it to, decreasing it by age, you know, at, at 10 years or so, give it to every 10 years or, or so. Um, also increase uh, uh, or opening it up to people who had comorbid diseases, you know, dependent on pay, uh, dependent upon age, not dependent upon age. Um, so, and th this was all in the time you know, again, from January of 21 through uh, like April of 21 that they had started with 65 plus and made their way down um, to at least 18 by April. Can you tell me about the VAERS reporting and an incident that you actually experienced in your pharmacy? Sure. Yeah. So the uh, VAERS reporting is a safety reporting feature that the CDC and the FDA use to monitor uh, vaccine reactions or vaccine adverse reactions. Um, and there's a lot of people that will tell you that the number of reports on the VAERS system is 10% of what actually happens in the population um or happened you know in in practice i don't know how true or not true you know i don't know the degree to how much that is true i do believe that it is the vares reporting system is uh underestimated the actual number i don't know what percent that would be um but i can say for my own personal career i had been administering vaccines uh since i graduated in 2000 in august of 2013 every flu season for sure and you know pneumonia shots shingles whatever throughout the rest of the year if it wasn't flu season so i had i've given thousands of shots um but in this time since the covid vaccine had or covid shot had come out it's not a vaccine it's an important part to reference that the cdc changed the definition of vaccine um i had an I had a someone had a reaction in my pharmacy and i submitted a vares report they they passed out. They went stiff as a board. I mean, I believe that they had a seizure just from what it looked like. I have no idea, but I've never seen someone have that kind of reaction. I mean, I've had people feel sick, nauseated from the COVID shot. Um, you know, I, I had never really had anyone have another reaction as far as I can remember to other shots. I mean, yes, a sore arm, but um, a lot of people told me I did a great job giving the shot, so I didn't really get many complaints about, you know, side effects happening from vaccine uh, injections. But th I mean, this was terrifying, so terrifying that I thought it was worthy of reporting to to the VAERS system because it was it was not right. Whatever happened to that young man. So when did the concern that we had of giving the shot to minors really kind of affect us personally sure it, it was april of 2021 uh, i had recently come across a couple of different uh papers and articles that kind of really piqued my interest and got me concerned about a few things um one which is one of the reasons and and things that i actually discussed with my supervisor was in early to mid-april uh, an article or a paper had come out that there were more uh adverse reactions reported to VAERS in the five months that we had been doing these these COVID shots than the previous 20 years combined for all shots. So in 20 years of flu, pneumonia, all the shots that we give to everybody, 
there was more reactions, more reports in five months just in starting this COVID vaccine or the COVID shot. And, and that was concerning. Uh, I also read uh, read Pfizer's paper in which it discussed um, pregnant women being exposed to their partners who had received the shot. They didn't want them coming in contact with them or potentially even breathing on them. Now, that's potentially common when it comes to n- new medications, you know, th- new unknown therapies. Um, pregnant women are, you know, a highly susceptible class of, you know, people who we don't want to get sick. We don't know what could happen to them and more importantly, the baby. So that does make sense, but it just struck me really weird and different reading, you know, what they were, what, what Pfizer was concerned about, but no one else was sharing that. I mean, we were, I mean, you could be getting the shot if you were a pregnant woman at that time. I mean, the CDC was recommending pregnant women get the shot in April of, of 21. So it was just combinations of all those things that were um, that I just didn't feel comfortable. Uh, we were also the company was also working on switching or switching or having access to Pfizer's vaccine, which Pfizer ha- was approved for people 16 and up, although we weren't allowed to give it to 16 year olds. We were only allowed to give it to 18. We were also concerned uh, Pfizer was right around the corner. Uh, from getting uh, emergency use use authorization in children 12 to 15. So uh, if and when, because it did happen, that went through, uh, pharmacists would be allowed to and required to give the Pfizer vaccine, Pfizer shot to children 12 and up at that point. Uh, younger children... Uh, w- there were there was talks of younger children uh, of moving that age down, moving that that uh, that age grouping down to the point where now six months and up are approved to get that shot. So we knew that as soon as they started to go after the children, you know, younger than 18, honestly, at that point, that it was only a matter of time before every child, you know, at this point, six months and up would be able to receive this unknown experimental mrna technology shot gene therapy technically if if you will i specifically remember getting that email sent from you know our previous employer stating that we would be administering the pfizer shot in addition to moderna which other companies and pharmacists were able to, that had Pfizer, were able to administer the shot to 16 and up, but we weren't. So this specifically would personally affect us because we had only been administering it to 18 and up, and now this would allow us the ability to administer to 12 and 17-year-olds. And we knew that that would potentially affect younger generations down the line, which it has after, you know, more approvals have gone through. So what would you say is our main duty as pharmacists in regard to providing vaccinations? Um, well, I, I think it's important to, I think it's important to highlight what our duty as a pharmacist is a little bit in general and and kind of vaccines is a little more specific um but as a pharmacist it's our job to ensure that medications are dispensed properly and safely um checking that peop, uh you know patients uh are qualified or able to ha- take medication safely you know whether it's they their lab values are in check or they uh, have or don't have a certain condition or, you know, we would call it sometimes a, a contraindication, something that would prevent you from having a medication because of uh, a bad reaction or, a, or, or a more significant consequence to it. Uh, it's also our responsibility to be competent um, when it comes to vaccine administration and also medication administration uh, or just dis- medication dispensing and, uh, 
to in, to check for patient populations at uh, at risk for certain vaccine preventable diseases. You know, easy answers are the annual influenza virus, uh, pneumonia. Uh, you know, I believe most colleges, um, at least in New York, I don't know if it's federal or not. You know, meningococcal vaccine. You know, it, it just it comes down to do are you in this certain you know category, age, gender. Uh, you know, comorbid disease, do you qualify to get this vaccine or this shot? Uh, vaccine safety is of the utmost importance. And I think part of that vaccine safety includes a risk benefit analysis, meaning do we, can we safely, do we know with high enough probability that you, that the patient will have a benefit from receiving a therapy or in this case a vaccine um, versus either having a bad reaction from a therapy or a vaccine and or having a a bad reaction from uh, you know in the in the vaccine case of a, a disease that we're trying to prevent so covid or the flu would be two great examples is giving the flu shot in someone going to keep them out of the hospital, keep them alive, keep them from getting symptoms. And the same thing, you know, was true for the, for the COVID shots is giving the COVID shot to X patient age or, you know, gender, what have you, is that going to be safe and appropriate versus the consequences of, you know, that person, child, developing COVID, being hospitalized, or, you know, unfortunate cases, sometimes death. Um, it was also important that we provided informed consent uh, prior to administration of vaccines, shots, and the same is true for medications. I mean, it goes back to, you know, creating our, you know, our initial intro of creating doubt. It's not our job. We don't try to create doubt. It's our job to inform them of the consequences of what could happen, what to expect, if this does happen, what to do, how to react, who to call, and things like that. Uh, we took an oath as pharmacists, and part of the oath is applying our knowledge and experience and skills to ensure optimal outcomes for patients. So I, I think uh, it's important to know, especially for the children, you know, this was a whole... It, the, this created the potential for a massive disaster. Um, I think Katie will talk a little bit more about that. She seems a little more adept at explaining it than I do when it comes to the, the risk benefit analysis. But we also took in part of that oath uh, was to uh, improve professional knowledge, expertise, and self-awareness. So again, continuing to learn, continuing to seek out information, to seek out the truth. Um, you know, not just, we have no obligation as pharmacists to surrender ourselves to the will of the CDC and the FDA. It is our license. It is our responsibility to ensure our patient safety. Um, the, the FDA is not the one who gets sued or can be held accountable. If a patient suffers a, a, a terrible adverse reaction um, that we had you know, through neglect or lack of, you know, understanding allowed to happen, you know, the, the, the FDA or the CDC doesn't, isn't held responsible. We can be held responsible both civilly through a, a, you know, financial compensation, or we can, you know, we could face jail time. I mean, there's been cases where pharmacists have gone to prison for manslaughter because they, gave the they administer the wrong concentration and things like that i mean it's it's not a joke to um when you're giving medication to people so it's important to continue to improve knowledge and uh be as self-aware of medications therapies as we can how are we you know keeping ourselves informed and up to date specifically really from the start of administering the shots all the way to when we made our, you know, decision to share our concerns with our regional district manager? Sure. Uh, great question. Uh, 
at first and and Katie will, will probably definitely be the first to admit this is when the when the COVID pandemic when COVID first hit, I was very curious about it. I, I wanted to make sure I knew what I, the best I could. It kind of seemed like a big deal, but not really. Two weeks to th- slow the spread, and you know where that you know goal po- goal post has been moved to now, to the point where I became obsessed with it because Katie and myself were on the front lines as pharmacists, so we were there every single day that we were working in public putting ourselves and our family at risk um, to continue to do our job and make sure that people had access to the medications that they needed. So I, I, I took every opportunity to research and throw myself into this crazy COVID pandemic as much as possible. Um, and, you know, obviously the internet, but just, just research studies, papers, articles, from our country, from our states, looking at how other physicians in our country, um, you know, were reacting and treating the situation and other countries as well. Um, you know, they may have some access to different medicine, but in general, uh, the reaction is the same um, as to how the, you know, how the pandemic spread the reactions that, you know, the, the reactions, the consequences that people have just looking to see what, what else was going on in other countries, um, you know, to try and stay as informed as possible. And also very important, looking back at history, uh, you know, specifically when it pertains to the, to the, to the sh- administration of the shop, but uh, you know, like the 1976 uh, bird influenza vaccine was a total miss. I mean, it was awful that, they the, the government told everyone they needed it, rushed the process, got it out there, and a lot of people suffered a lot of terrible, um, sometimes non-reversible consequences to that vaccine. Uh, the anthrax vaccine in the military, the, the dengue fever vaccine in the Philippines, um, two other examples in history where we thought it was a great idea to give you know the anthrax vaccine to the military, and the dengue fever vaccine to children in the Philippines, but uh, a phenomenon called antibody dependent enhancement um, happened in both of those situations. And uh, a brief talk, what that is, is your body becomes uh, super sensitive to the disease you're trying to treat. Um, so the, the like in the dengue fever situation, the idea is you'd give the vaccine And the next year when dengue fever was around, it was mostly children were the ones who were mostly suffering from the from the fever. Um, The fever would be less because their body was exposed to the this vaccine and had the antibodies. But what ended what ended up happening is the antibodies that were created, like super sensitized their body to the dengue fever. So when children came in contact with this disease, their fevers were much, much, much worse. Um, and I, I believe, and I would even say I know, or think I know, that that's what's happening with this coronavirus. Um, I mean, even Dr. Fauci from one of the uh, White House press COVID press briefings mentions that sometimes vaccines can have this reaction. Sometimes they can cause worse problems and worse things to happen. So it's not like we're, you know, this isn't just, we're not just saying this because it's, you know, what we think or what we want to be true. I mean, this is a known thing that has happened to the fact of even Dr. Fauci mentioning it. Um, And the proof of that, I would say, is uh, look at uh, papers coming out from the UK. You know, 92% of COVID hospitalizations are in people who are boosted. Um, you, you know, you, you that, that doesn't happen in, in the people who aren't vaccinated because I believe they don't have this, this antibody dependent enhancement situation going on. Um, another uh, example about, you know, being informed and up to date is I believe in the last six months, Denmark and possibly other Scandinavian countries change their shot recommendations. Um, they do not want any children to receive any of the shots and people under 50 are to no longer be boosted. 
And this is what I told my supervisor when in addressing my initial concerns with him, I didn't feel comfortable giving the shot to people younger than 50 because this information and the data that I had reviewed and seen, the risk benefit just wasn't there. People under 50 outside of people who had other comorbid diseases, but in the general population or generally healthy population, people under 50 were not at risk for hospitalization, were not at risk for for death from from COVID. So I just couldn't, I just, I, it didn't make sense to continue to give a shot to someone when they potentially wouldn't benefit from it. And, and that doesn't include, which has also recently come out in news, that natural immunity is either as good, or I believe recently better than the shot. I mean, one of the boxes that you have to check on our paperwork when you're filling out for the shot is, have you had COVID? I mean, the number of people who had COVID and we still gave the shot to it, it just doesn't make sense. If you had COVID, you have the antibodies to both the spike protein and its capsid, you know, what what encloses all of the vaccine proteins, or excuse me, the virus proteins. So why would we give someone a shot to create an antibody reaction? It, 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 so many things just didn't make sense and didn't line up with how... I like to practice, I think Katie as well, how we like to practice medicine, as well as how I thought medicine was practiced in, in the United States. But we've come to find out that's not always the case. So how would you summarize what our main concerns were? I think our main concerns were uh, the rush development and approval pot and, and approval process of the COVID-19 uh, shots. Um, that's ultimately, I, I think, the majority of it. And with that, you know, kind of secondary comes, there's no long-term safety data. You know, I mean, that's something that is required to tell people when you give someone a medication, you know, what are the, what are the, what adverse reactions could happen, long-term adverse reactions. And we had none of that information. Um, and also providing informed consent. We had none of the information, in my opinion, to provide informed consent. I mean, how, how I couldn't tell people, you know, take children, you know, best example. I couldn't tell a, a caretaker or a parent what this shot will do to their child in one, two, five, ten years. I had no, I, I had no idea. I mean, the same is true for a pregnant woman. I had no idea the consequences. We had no idea the consequences of giving this shot to pregnant women. Uh, well, honestly, pregnant or honestly, women in general, you know, and now the data is coming out that uh, miscarriages are, are up. Stillbirths are up. Fertility, meaning people, you know, w women getting pregnant is down. Uh, changes to women's menstrual cycles. Um, I mean, it, it's. In my opinion, it's it's a disaster. Uh, you know, that's probably putting it lightly. It's a disaster. Um, survivability of children when it comes to COVID itself. Um, I mean, sadly, last I knew, 452 children um, had passed from COVID, which is terrible. But that number compared to the annual, annual flu is fractions of a percent one percent i mean it's nothing in comparison to what the annual to the number of children that are hospitalized and killed by the annual flu so again that goes back to the the risk benefit it just doesn't make sense that we were giving the shot to children when they had almost no adverse consequences from covid um, myocarditis uh you know that's another huge concern that we had in children definitely but but really young men i mean i think around 30 like males 30 or 35 and younger um you know myocarditis is a huge concern in males uh, females as well but not it's not as high as it is in males and it just again it didn't make sense i mean even a fairly healthy a half healthy you know 35 year old male had 
a 99.9 X percent chance of survival from COVID. It doesn't make sense that we would, doesn't make sense to me or us that we would administer a, a shot with unknown potentially short-term and long-term consequences. And once the information started to come out that myocarditis was a concern, I, I don't know how people are still administering it. I mean, it's no coincidence that the number of professional athletes who have dropped dead and or had heart attacks while playing the sport or just in general is up. It's like 200% or some crazy number. I don't know the actual number, but I know it's up. It's up way more than it should be. I mean, these, these professional athletes, mostly men, are in the best shape of their lives to play the sport that they're in. And yet they're, I mean, a heart attack, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. I remember specifically, and this was before our company at the time had announced that they want to bring on Pfizer, hearing incidents of male boys who were, well, they must have been 16, 17, 18, having the myocarditis you know, diagnosis. And at the time, our son, my stepson was 14, 15. So, I mean, that's a huge reason why we made it very important and top priority to really stay afoot on what was coming out because that, you know, personally affects us and our family and our family safety. And you know, to have a survivability rate of 99.9x percent, and then to risk potentially having a life-changing diagnosis, it just did not make sense to us. It did not sit well with me. Um, You know, we have our son and we also had our daughter who at the time when the pandemic initially started, she was younger than one. So, I mean, this was not a joke to us in the slightest. We were coming home and changing our clothes the second we got home. I mean, I know Joel had talked about how we were on the front lines, we were going to work and we had no idea, you know, in the very beginning, we had no idea what was going on, um, how easily it could be spread, what the effects could be. So yeah, we were coming home, instantly changing our clothes. Um, When we were both working the same weekend, our parents who are in their 60s or 70s would be watching our children and we were concerned for their health. We were, you know, designating them their own bathroom in the house and cleaning everything before they even got here. We had our air purifiers on and doing everything we possibly could. Um, So all this to say, none of this was taken lightly. You know, it was affecting our own lives and we wanted to make sure that we were putting our best foot forward as healthcare providers in terms of how we're treating and caring for our patients um, to have the possibility of a child having a lifelong side effect from a shot that I had administered them. I mean, that's something I would have to live with for the rest of my life. And that was just something I was not morally or ethically comfortable with doing. I think, uh, I mean, on a quick follow-up to that, I, at the time that wasn't, this was not a, a thought in our head, but the current situation now is the CDC has approved these shots on the childhood vaccine schedule. So I think, you know, I was, again, we had no idea what was going to happen down the road, but the best example, uh, our daughter, um, you know, if should we send her to public school, you know, it's possible that she will have to get these sh- shots, get a COVID shot to go to public school. Um, and that's that could be true for every child. I mean, the states have to decide what they're going to do and how they're going to handle that. But I mean, that's, you know, we didn't know at the time what we know now, but I mean, that that's the reality of what's happening now is children could be subject to forced, you know, could be forced to get these shots 
if they want to attend public school. And the, when you start talking, when you start to break that down, what does that really mean? I mean, that means that a lot of families, a lot of families don't have the financial options to move to a different school district or state that doesn't have that. Or, I mean, a lot of families, especially with the current inflation, don't don't have time to do anything other than work, you know, just to try and, and get by. So I, just, I think that's just another important but also scary kind of proponent of this whole COVID situation, the vaccines and COVID itself is, you know, that the government has made a lot of moves to to force and push people into corners and and obey what the government wants us to do. You want to go to public school? You got to get the shot. Same thing is true for the vaccine passports, you know, all of that stuff. You want to attend this basketball game? You want to attend this wedding? You know, I mean, Kyrie Irving can't even play in his home basketball court in New York. I mean, it, it's just, it, it's, it's, mind-boggling to say the least yeah and to add on to that um the most recent VAERS data on vaccine injuries that was updated february 2nd so you know we're in march now but for children six months to five years old who received who received the covid19 shot showed almost six thousand adverse events including 244 cases rated as serious and 14 reported deaths for five to 11 year olds, almost 17,000 reports of adverse events, including 805 rated as serious and 33 reported deaths. So again, um, just did not ethically or morally feel sound to be a part of that. Um, To quote from a 2005 practice alert and policy guidelines regarding matters of conscience, if a pharmacy employs a pharmacist that has identified circumstances that would preclude the filling of prescriptions for particular products, the owner and supervising pharmacist should devise within reason accommodations that will respect the pharmacist's choice while assuring delivery of services to patients in need. This may include special attention to scheduling of professionals to allow a pharmacist who has a religious, moral, or ethical objection to practice simultaneously with another pharmacist who will fill the requested prescription, entering into collaborative arrangements with pharmacies in close proximity or other accommodations designed to protect the public. I think... uh... But to kind of to, to kind of summarize that uh, and kind of put it into like real practice, um, just so you kind of understand what that means in terms of like for a pharmacist of practice, um, you know, the, the easy example or I think the best example is like the plan B, right? The morning after pill. If you have a religious, if you disagree with that and have a religious reason to not want to give the, the morning after pill that's your prerogative and you cannot be forced to give that to someone. However, as the, the guidelines mention, you, you can't discriminate that person. You can't, you know, make fun of them or, or tell them that they're a horrible person as an example. Um, So I, I think that really ultimately just means that pharmacists have their own ability to practice how they want to. And as long as they don't, upset or you know ruin the patient uh, interaction at their own pharmacy um then there's nothing you know th- they have the ability to to provide to to not provide a, a therapy or a service if so as long as some other accommodation can be made m- meaning um another pharmacist is there or there's another pharmacy down the road that could take care of it and, and so forth So what happened when we discussed our concerns with our regional pharmacy manager? Um, Well, we, we kind of laid it all out together on the phone. um, What, 
I mean, honestly, a lot of the things that we have kind of discussed now, um, you know, the ages that we, you know, 50 and younger was an age I, I thought didn't need it just from the data, the VAERS reporting. Um, we kind of laid all that out. And um, well, I mean, long story short, they they fired us. They they weren't they were not willing to make an accommodation. Um, you know, it, it their claim was that it was a you know, a job requirement, although it's technically not listed to, to administer COVID shots as a job requirement, but that was their claim was that it was a job requirement and, um, they were not willing to make an accommodation, um, which I think would have been very easily done. Everything at the time was scheduled online. Um, so they could have just turned off, you know, turned it off, for children under 18 or, you know, they could have put up, put, you know, me specifically in a pharmacy with another pharmacist who would have administered the shots. Um, I, I definitely, I mean, we believe there's something that could have been done instead of just, you know, cutting us, cutting us off cold Turkey, but that's what happened. And who else did you express our concerns to? So I had originally anonymously called the uh, our ethics line, uh, and I had sent an anonymous email to our media relations department um, because I wanted, I was hoping that they would see my concerns and at least send a company wide email addressing that they, you know, that someone had had those concerns and thoughts. Um, they fell on deaf ears. I reached out to multiple local, national, and international media organizations to try to get someone to cover or talk about what I was thinking and kind of feeling. Um, I reached out to a professional pharmacy fraternity organization, um, again, to see if anyone else there, you know, felt the same or, or at least, um, you know, was willing to hear me out and, you know, kind of hear me get, get my, get our perspective. Um, I reached out to the, I mean, technically as a whistleblower to the New York State Attorney General Letitia James's office, because um, I I feel that we were violating informed consent laws. I reached out to OSHA with concerns over vaccine shedding, like it's mentioned in Pfizer's trial. Um, and I also sent an email to the New York State Board of Pharmacy. And did you ever receive a response back from anyone? Um, I got the response I got from OSHA was to reach out to the governor's office. And at the time, Governor Cuomo um, was running the medical uh, medical situation in this country into the ground. He had locked up the elderly in nursing homes. I mean, he forbode pharmacists from prescribing you know, or for, for, forbode pharmacists from dispensing medications like ivermectin and hdq that were legally written by doctors um uh, leticia james office called me back but would not would not follow up with any of my concerns relating to uh to governor cuomo and like the nursing home event which for me was paramount to the number of deaths that we had you know that that kind of was a big that was part of why i reached out to her office but Ultimately, no. no I, the responses were fell on deaf ears. Do you feel that our employer could have reasonably accommodated us in regards to you not administering the COVID shots to 15 under and specifically for me not administering to minors and children? I think so. I mean, again, I said... Uh, everything was online. Everything was like by a by online appointment. So I, I think I'll, I'll speak to my, for myself, at least uh, I, I was floating in different stores. So they could have put me in a store that had another pharmacist, a pharmacist that would have given the shots. Um, I don't think that that, I don't think that that would have been difficult at all. I mean, there's a couple different pharmacies that had more than one pharmacist. So they could have done that. Um, and I believe that they could have, I don't know, but I think they could have figured out a way to accommodate Katie with, uh, you know, just not allowing people under 18 to make an appointment, you know, uh, but I don't hundred percent know how easy that could have been done with like the online technology, but 
with technology these days, I don't imagine it would have been very hard to block that out for people younger than 18 for Katie. Um, yeah. And I do know, cause at that time I was pumping and they were able to block out at least blocks of time where I w- would be able to do that. And also, you know, the patients would be able to be reasonably accommodated because the only time I ever worked, you know, any amount of days in the row in a row would be the weekend. Otherwise, it was pretty much just one day at a time. So they would be able to receive the shot in a reasonable time by the other pharmacist who worked at my store. That doesn't include the number of pop up clinics, too, that happen. I mean, they were all I mean. Their pop-up clinics were happening in schools and firehouses. I mean, it it's not fair to say that our pharmacy or, or Katie's pharmacy, at least, was the only place to get the COVID shots. That's that's definitely not an accurate statement. And I feel it's important to note too that we weren't refusing to give all vaccines. It was just this specific shot under, at the time, emergency use authorization and for specific populations. So why a whistleblower suit? Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Sure. I think the, uh, I think the whistleblower suit, we, we filed the whistleblower suit because we wanted to stand up for our rights as healthcare providers and pharmacists and uh, the rights of our patients uh, to have to be both informed and to have safe therapies um, or access to safe therapies. Um, it, it it would not we didn't find it appropriate to continue to go on um, without filing some kind of suit, because it, in this crazy world of tyranny, especially you know specifically medical tyranny i mean someone we feel someone had to stand up i mean it's not right that um you know governors aren't allowing prescribers to prescribe drugs they want for their patients and not right that they are preventing pharmacists from dispensing drugs for patients as long as the the medications are safe um it, so many different things that are of concern in this in the current COVID healthcare system that we're in, um, we thought it was, we thought we needed to stand up for, again, ourselves and, and our patients and the children, because um, I don't, you know, the number of people, the number of people not talking about this concern, uh, you know, vaccinating or giving the shot to children is concerning to me. Um, and I'm sure Katie, well, definitely Katie as well. Um we, we, we just thought it, it was time for, you know, we thought people needed to know the truth. We we believe it's the truth. I mean, it's hard to say because new things are coming out every day, but this is what we believe we should have the right to do as healthcare providers, you know, not provide therapies if we don't think they're safe. Um, and, and that didn't happen. So we're, we're, we're fighting back. And we've had other pharmacists in other states, you know, reach out to us who feel the same way and who have either been fired from their their jobs as well for refusing to get the shot or even some refusing to administer it as well. And I know even within the company that we were working with, you know, when all of this came out, other pharmacists in the company agreed with our concerns, especially for children, but we're too afraid to come out and say anything because they knew that they would lose their job. So um, it definitely has not been easy for us. It has been a huge financial struggle for both of us to lose our full-time jobs. It has been extremely difficult to find a full-time pharmacist job that A, didn't require administering the shot, or B, didn't require that we also had the shot, even if it was a remote position. So work from home position, still couldn't do it because of a, a choice that we made for ourselves. 
It's insane. I mean, it was insane. Like looking for looking for jobs, and like you think you luck out with a remote job where you have zero pa- patient, you know, zero uh, contact, physical contact with someone, and still had to be still required to 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 have had the shot. I mean, it, it's it's absolutely, and this is after years after we know that the shot doesn't even prevent transmission. I mean, it's absolutely mind blowing. And, you know, just to share, we have, you know, really fought as hard as long and we, as we can, but we, we need your help at this point. Um, We have gone through our 401k. We have maxed out credit cards, taken out loans you know, we have to really kind of be vulnerable and and ask for help and and really for support in this mission. So we have created a website to start a fundraiser. And, you know, the mission of our fundraiser is really, really important to us. We're very passionate about it. It's not just about, um, you know, winning the case at the end of the day. It's about fighting for the rights and safety of children in regards to these shots. It's about drawing attention to ethical and safety concerns raised by us, other healthcare professionals. There have been doctors that have come out with concerns and they basically have also gotten fired or their medical license have been taken away because they're speaking against the narrative that the government or big pharma wants you to hear, you know, there's journalists, other concerned citizens that have spoken out about this and really just very valid concerns at the end of the day. Um, Is there anything that you want to speak to for the mission? Um, I mean, I think that was it. I I think standing up for the, for children is the most important Uh, informing, informing people parents uh caretakers um you know there's a lot of information that we have been fed that has been either baloney or you know purpose propaganda to to confuse you know to confuse us or lead us astray um i mean it's also you know not covid shot related per se but you know kind of medical tyranny related i mean th- this is a scary time to to be it's a scary time to be in healthcare and living in the U S and I think the re- most of the rest of the world um, w- with the current medical situation that's going on. I mean, you know, our children are going to be raised and have to, uh, they are ultimately the ones, you know, 20, 30 years down the road, they're the ones who are going to have to be s- dealing with the consequences of what happens now you know, this medical tyranny, like I said, not allowing people to prescribe. I mean, you know, there's a California uh, bill, AB 2092 or 2098, I think, you know, if you speak out against COVID, you know, COVID disinformation, they the, the California board will take your medical license if you're a physician. I mean, like that is absolutely terrifying that a physician can cannot speak their mind or their professional opinion to their patient without fear of it going against a certain narrative and, and, and risk losing their license. And the same thing for therapies as well. I mean, uh, what's to say that the government wouldn't just say you have to give these therapies in these situations. And then, you know, if they don't, they, their license is revoked. I mean, it's, it's, it's terrifying you know, what has gone on between big pharma and the government collusion and government and collusion with big tech censorship. Um, We, we, we have to stand up and fight now. And I think our case uh, and our, our case and our fundraiser, we believe is, is a great way to do that. Um, We need, you know, we need funds. We've exhausted everything that we have trying to do this. Um, And we also just as important, if not more important is, getting our story out there, getting it to go viral, having people understand that there are still, you know, there are still pharmacists and healthcare providers who 
are standing up for for patients, standing up for children, standing up for the right to practice safe medicine. Um, so we'd appreciate donations as well as uh, sharing friends and family and coworkers of this video, uh, of this podcast and of our website um, so that you, so that people can hear the truth, hear our truth, and uh, hopefully we can make a change. Absolutely. And it's, it's just so much more than a donation or a social media share to us. This is, at the end of the day, it's about upholding the sacred patient provider relationship and being able to provide informed consent. It's about not using our children as science experiments in learning years down the road how damaging that was. It's about showing big pharma that you can't just fire and throw away dedicated healthcare providers who bring valid concerns to the forefront. This is about opening up an open dialogue and space for other pharmacists to feel safe and healthcare, other healthcare providers to feel safe, to share their concerns without fear of being terminated. Because if we're not able and allowed to do that, then what the hell is the point, really? So like Joel was saying, no donation is too big or too small. Every penny is greatly appreciated. And if you can't donate today, you know, some other ways that you can truly help this cause, our mission, share our story, share this podcast and the website with family, friends, your neighbors and coworkers, encourage donations or also a viral spreading of the story because together we can all make a difference. And you'll find the link to our fundraising website in the show notes below where you can learn more. And sharing the podcast link is probably the safest way to share on social media to really prevent being censored by big tech, as Joel had mentioned. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for listening and being open-minded to really hearing out our story and for also sharing our story. And also I wanted to mention on our website, we will be posting blogs as more information comes out, you know, sharing the information that we feel is important to be up to date on. So if you want to stay up to date, you can sign up for our newsletter as well. You can check out the blogs on our website and we appreciate you. And thank you, yeah. Joel, for being here. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Thank you all for listening and taking the time to check out our website and hopefully making, an od uh, making a donation and, and sharing. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Rising into Mindful Motherhood podcast. If this episode resonated with you or gave you an aha moment, stop what you're doing right now and write a review. This simple act of kindness helps me get this podcast out to connect with as many women as I possibly can. I also have a special offer. If you send me a screenshot of your review, I will take $250 off one of my premium coaching containers. Let me know what resonated with you the most and why. So connect with me in my free Facebook community or tag me on Instagram. You'll find both listed below. Thanks again from the bottom of my heart for tuning in to this episode and I'll see you next time.